started here. That is the first time I ever made a noise when I did that. I know it'll be like recording Zoom podcast. <laughs> Normally it's just like, oh, okay, it started. And now it's just like, hello. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much for meeting with us today. I did. I'm very glad that we get to speak with you. Um, would you mind introducing yourself to the audience and tell them what you do? Yeah. So what's up, y'all? My name is Giella. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. Um, I'm a singer. I'm a rapper. I'm a DJ, community organizer, um, cultural organizer. People say the people's DJ. I'm all the things. <laughs> oh, they got it. They got a list. They are prepared. <laughs> Period. I do it all. <laughs> okay. And so I did have a couple questions. Yeah, so, for sure. Oh my gosh. I have a whole notebook, so I don't forget. So can you share with us some personal projects that you're going through with whether in your music career or in your personal career or your organizations, like what are some current personal projects that you've been doing so far? Yeah, so right now um, I'm starting to slowly get back into hosting events, um, DJing, singing, um, and I've been recording a lot dur during quarantine. I did do some, um, some music, so that's been really, really exciting. Um, my dance party is called Duval Folk, so it's coming back next week um, for folks who are in Jacksonville, Florida. If you're, you know, from those neck of the woods or from Florida in general, um, I host like a queer BIPOC dance party. So that will be coming back next week. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then, like I said, I've been working on an EP, which has been really fun. Yes, um, I have finally set my notes off to my um, producer or excuse me my engineer so that is in the works so I'm really excited about that um, and then organizing wise I've been organizing with this organization um, in Jacksonville called the Jacksonville Community Action Committee so I support with comms and I'm also on campaigns um, so that's been really, really fun. Um, and also supporting, I do all the things. So also trying to support um, another organization, which is part of a national org called SONG, which stands for Southerners on New Ground. Um, okay. So we're trying to start like a Jacksonville crew um, and that um, organization is mostly focused on ending cash bails and melting ice. Um, so it's really exciting because that order is kind of really centered around like queer and trans black and brown liberation. Um, and so, yeah, that's been really exciting. And then just like uplifting, like whatever orgs are like happening here. Um, and that's pretty much all the thousand million things I've been working on. <laughs> thousand million is right. You got a whole set here. And you mentioned an EP. What should we be expecting from the EP? What kind of vibe should we be like ready for? So my EP is called It's Fine, <laughs> and okay. that has pretty much been my mood for a long, long time. Um, I have it tattooed on me. Um, it's a matching tattoo. Oh, so cute. Thank you. Yeah, with me and three of my other friends, or two of my other friends, um, we organized uh, for this, this uh, organization called Girls Rock um, Jacksonville. And it's basically like a week long summer camp for girls, gender non-conforming and trans youth where they get put into bands and like, you know, write music together. And that year was just like a struggle because it was just the three of us. And we just would, every time that something wild would happen, we'd be like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just always been like my go-to phrase, like, you know what, it's fine. Like it's gonna get done. And you can just say it in so many ways, you know, but during quarantine, it was just like one thing right after the other, you know, like I was oh, having yeah. mental health, working from home, like I'm a Capricorn, so my routines got messed up, you know, went through a breakup, yeah, like, just went through all the things, had to move, you know, um, and it was just like so many things were happening all the time, and all I had kept saying to myself, you know what, it's fine, like it's gonna happen, you know, um, and a lot of this music um, that I wrote and also like co-wrote with people were from like a lot of my past, like dating. Um, this is my first EP that's really centered around like me talking about being in relationships with women um, and just kind of like oh. my experience with them um, and, you know, also losing like friendships with um, women. And so, yeah, it just has been like a super interesting process to get it done um emotionally like mentally for me um because it's like very close to me and I, and I feel very vulnerable about it 
Um, so yeah, that's pretty much like a long winded answer to say that I'm really excited to put it out. Um, I'm feeling a lot more confident about it now that I have like sat with the music. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to put it out. Start recording music videos and getting cute merch. <laughs> Oh, the, you sound so excited, which makes me very excited. I'm like, yes, I'm ready to hear this. Yes. And you mentioned with COVID-19, has this like affected your work in any sort of way? You've mentioned it briefly stating like with everything going on, especially with this la- last year, like I know everything is fine, but you know, sometimes certain struggles push through. So like, how did you think it affected your music or how you viewed like what's going on with everything that's happening related to like the vaccine or like how did you it affect your views on things? Yeah, it affected me in a large way. Um, in my day job, um, I work in infectious disease. So I work with a lot of young people um, who are queer, who are trans, who are living with HIV, um, who are experiencing homelessness through COVID. And so a lot of that work, because I do direct service work, affects me in like huge ways, you know? And then seeing like my young people that I work with just kind of like pretty much be pushed out to the margins even more than what they already have been put out, you know, really just like affected me, you know, and made me not motivated made me want to push even harder. Um, During COVID, you know, I supported some people with getting their lights paid, like doing some like, um, just like grassroots organizing around like supporting people. And for me, it just like, the major thing was that a lot of my routines just like kind of really um, got affected, you know? Um, I couldn't focus, I couldn't get things together. Um, I was not doing any of my homework that my therapist gave me, (laughs) you know, it just was, it was really, really hard. Um, And, you know, I'm finally starting to get out of, I feel like the fog, um, you know, just to have a mental health moment and to like speak from transparency, you know, I am someone who suffers from like having, um, you know, depression from anxiety, um, also ADHD, which is something that is really new to a lot of what fuels a lot of my Mm -hmm. depression and my anxiety. And so I think it's just like being real with myself and being like, you know what, it's okay. Like you, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, things that I tell my clients all the time, like there's nothing wrong. Like you got this, like you are better than this and you're going to get through this you know um and just manifesting and dreaming more um and slowing down you know I think that's what a lot of what COVID taught me is to be okay with pausing being okay with resting we love that and we love hearing about the manifestations like yes me has been focusing so hard on providing positive manifestations but you also did mention like mental health and I know that the concept of mental health is a very strange concept for a lot of like Hispanics within the our Latinx community to understand. Mm-hmm. So it's, I assume it's a little bit more difficult, especially if you are also part of the LGBT community. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, you know, like I come from a family where my mom was very accepting, you know, when I came out like way back when, you know, and she really encourages me, especially through like my organizing and speaking like truth to my power. Um, and yeah, like Latinx women or Latina women are often the ones who hold a lot of, you know, managing the house, of getting the things together. We're the workers, you know, we do all the things. Um, at least my mama was anyways, you know, she, you know, was a petty officer and um, was, you um, always like the go-getter in my family, you know, always the one doing it. And so I really look to her in a lot of ways when it comes to like my work ethic, but at the same time, just like her, I'm definitely an over-functioner, you know, where I'm always doing the absolute most, you know, even when I told you all the things you, that I did, I'm like, oh my God, you, you need to cut some things out. <laughs> oh so, so yeah, it's, um, it's been a struggle, but like I said, my mom really embraces the fact that I go to therapy um, and loves the fact that I like really take time to like take care of myself. Um, and I'm always reminding her that she needs to do the same, so. Which is very important. I We've been, at least for Yes Me How, we have been trying to advocate for like more um, focusing on your mental health and realizing like it shows in different ways, such as like there's different ways on how it shows like for ADHD with 
men and women or how it shows in certain like cultures and like races where it shows differently depending on it. So like, oh, sorry. Oh no, I was agreeing with you. <laughs> so um, certain things would seem a little like toxic within like uh, mental health where not necessarily it's that itself, but like machismo culture, we've been going into that. So I do have a question because Pride Month is coming up soon and you are an POC and LGBT creator. So what are some inspirations that you found within your two communities that you put into your music or in your everyday life? Yeah, I definitely try to be like as proud as I can be to be someone who is Afro-Latina that, you know, I'm not afraid to like speak out around like what's happening around BLM and also what's happening um, in Mexico and like all the, the, you know, terrible things that happen there, like with poverty and also just like speaking out against like, um, you know, Mexico being like one of the biggest countries that deports most of its people, you know, um, and having a lot of um, things within like Mexican culture, you know, anti-Blackness that happens in Mexico, you know. Mm -hmm. um, something recently my partner they are an amazing um also um lexican person as well <laughs> and so we uh we have a lot of exchanges around like what happens in mexico and um you know dreaming about like what it would look like to have more spaces that are centered around like you know afro-mexican things um and learning that like even during the slave trade that one and two people went through Mexico, like in Veracruz, you know, that was a huge port um, when it came to that, uh, the, um, when it came to the Atlantic slave trade, you know, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people just don't know that. And so I tried to be very vocal around like my identity, um, not only as a, um, a queer person, but also as a black, you know, Mexican person and really centering like what, Afro-Latino people go through who live in the South um, because a lot of times like we do feel very isolated. We do feel very um, not talked about, you know, and like Black Latinas are just as valid as like any type, you know, of Latina. Um, and we just don't see a lot of that representation or have a lot of conversations around what anti-Blackness is in Latino that, you know, culture, not even in Mexico, but, you know, all across, you know, um, the continent. And, you know, it's just like something that I try to bring up and something that I try to center and also do my own research on, you know, I'm still navigating a lot of things that I even went through as a kid, you know, I am out of all like my primas, like I'm the only like Black, you know, Mexican person mm -hmm and having to unlearn a lot of things that were like put onto me and also check my cousins when they, you know, say stuff that is like not okay to say, you know? Um, and also just validating myself as a black, you know, Latinx person because I am valid, you know, and telling myself that um, because I'm not someone um, who grew up in a household uh, where I spoke Spanish, but I don't know my black family. And the only family that I know is like, my mom's family, you know, I grew up with all my primas and like, you know, eating tortillas and, you know, chorizo and all the <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I had, you know, putting pots in the oven and having our butter filled with, with beans, you know, like I had all of those like very like um, mixed, like, um, like a mix of like Mexican and like black uh, household, but you know, in some ways I did feel like disconnected from my like Mexicanness as well because I didn't speak Spanish and I didn't grow up around a lot of Hispanic people. I grew up in mostly, okay. I grew up around mostly like black um, people like where I went to school, um, who I hung out with, who I dated, you know? So, so yeah, it's been um, very interesting, like kind of like identifying, um, you know, things that I need to heal for myself around my own, you know, Blackness, queerness, and like Latino thatness, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And you, you spoke about a lot of points, especially like the very stereotypical and like the cookie cutter version of what people consider to be like yeah. a Latinx person. Though they're like, I've shared the same experiences. Like I've put like my pots in the oven for like yeah. organization and had certain desserts where I'm like so surprised where other people don't have flan every other Saturday. I'm like, what are you 
eating yeah. then. <laughs> so like with that, um, you did mention that you didn't really grow up speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. And this is more of kind of like a personal question. I hope that I'm not like being offensive in any type of way, but I do know that um, when it comes to pronouns, such as in the Spanish language, is there like yeah. a struggle, especially if they focus, since I do notice they focus a lot on feminine and masculine pronouns, like heavily yeah. in the Spanish language. Yeah, I think for me, um, a lot of like where my identity sits more so has to do with like how Americans and like how like, basically like America has like set what like women have to be like what women have to do you know and mm -hmm. I understand that still in a lot of countries that like the binary language still does pull a lot from I would say still pulls a lot from like white supremacy and so for me when it comes to like you know, um, like folks who speak Spanish and they use like she and her pronouns or they use like Mika or a, uh, you know, whatever. I, I don't know, I don't speak, you know, fluent in Spanish. <laughs> but the ones that I've heard, you know, <laughs> you know, it doesn't bother me, you know, because I still do identify as a Mika. You know, my mom calls me that every time I go home or when I'm around her or when I talk to her on the phone. Um, and I still identify as a sister, you know, I still um, identify as a um, as a niece, you know, I don't, um, those don't feel like wrong to me or like when Spanish people call me ma, like that doesn't bother me at all. Um, I actually feel very validated in a lot of those ways. Um, just because again, like when I am around, like, especially here in Jacksonville, I'll say, cause you know, it's situational. Like when I go to Miami, you know, people speak Spanish to me all the time. Cause like Cuban black people are oh, very yeah. common there, you know what I mean? But here in Jacksonville, like when I go get food or something like that, like my partner, like I said, is more, um, they're Blexican as well, but Mm -hmm. to some folks they can read as like being I guess quote-unquote Mexican you know more Mexican yeah. than what I look like but like I said that's all like geographical because like mm -hmm. I said we both in Miami or we both in Puerto Rico they both gonna speak Spanish to us point blank period you know but yeah. here like you know they'll get food and they'll speak Spanish to them but then when they come to me then they start speaking English you know so it's like it's all like geographical like I feel um and so yeah it's just a lot of um a lot of unlearning I feel that people have to do you know yes of course and I hopefully I didn't I didn't want to come as like offensive in any way I oh, am no, no. cisgendered like female yeah. I didn't want to come off because I just it was a genuine question I did have I always yeah. wondered and like I said like you know and people get confused by that because you know for me anyways like it for me identifying as like a non-binary person like I do feel validated in Spanish culture when folks call me mija you know I feel validated mm -hmm. in that um because I do identify as that way you know I love when my mom calls me that I love when my madrina calls me that or any of my tias and things like that because that makes me feel like I'm at home like because my mom is someone that like um always calls me that you know I've, I've always been that, and that's what I grew up being called so and you also mentioned where when you went to high school there was more of like a higher rise of people in the black community so mm -hmm. did you ever feel like there was a moment where you kind of were like in between cultures? Because oh, I've noticed wow. a lot of kids when they are raised in the U.S. and but their uh, their parents are primarily like I can English today, I promise, <laughs> where they're primarily Hispanic and they're, they're heavy Spanish speakers and they come from a very close family and they're Hispanic yeah. and then they go to school and it's kind of like code switching. Like you went from like I am this perfect Hispanic child to suddenly I am the most American kid in the class and I wanted to see how you would view on that like being yeah, both black yeah, and sure. Mexican yeah for sure like the school that I went to it wasn't heavily populated with a lot of black folks but I mostly hung around like black people mm -hmm. and I would say like I was starting to notice like more of like Osher's like being ostracized from like black and Latinx communities more so like when I was like in elementary and middle school most so because like my teachers, you know, my, my government name is Graciela. And so like my teachers would be like, oh, that's a little too hard to say. So we're gonna call you Gracie, you know? And so that would be me like, 
I could feel that's when I really started distancing myself from like my, you know, Afro Latina dadness, especially around like my tias when they were calling me Graciela. I'd be like, no, like uh, that's not what I want to be called. I want to be called Gracie, 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 Gracie. And now when I got into my 20s, like I really started reclaiming my name and being like, you know what? Like, can I cuss? I don't know if I can. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, you know what? Fuck that teacher. Like, I, my name is Graciela and I'm reclaiming that. And I'm speaking truth to my name, you know, there's like, there's this poem uh, that my partner always sends me all the time where it's talking about like, you know, letting people like, you know, trip over your words and knowing like that's power to your ancestors, basically something like that. And <laughs> that's what I really feel like I'm doing, you know, like really healing those younger versions of myself, where I felt like I had to distance myself from my afro latina thatness, you know, where I didn't want to take Spanish in high school, I wanted to, you know, kind of like, like move away from that because also on the other hand you know being fetishized you know being like um being like oh your hair is that your hair like it's so curly it's so this it's so that you know your skin what's what's happening with your skin you know um and just feeling like really weird around that you know and still also like I said learning like what that is because even in my like Af Afro that ness like still being put down um, in my own culture for being black, you know, like there's so mm -hmm. much heavy anti-blackness, like within like oh, yes. um, Afro-Latina, that culture. And so having to, again, like I said, just like heal those parts of myself um, and just not like, and try to like normalize that and be like, you know what, like, no, like who you are and like what you experience is valid. Um, and you don't have to feel like you have to live in this dual world. Um, even though we do live in that dual world as far as like our consciousness and things like that um and things that we experience but um you know just having to tell myself that like hey it's okay you know and don't feel like you're other because you're not other like you are a black like mexican person and you're real you know and that's valid you fit all the categories you're not just other you're all of the categories exactly and i love being now that like i said i'm older and I'm able to like heal myself, I'm happy to be all the things, you know, like, especially because you know what, baby, I'm getting paid, you know? <laughs> now they like that shit. Now they eating that shit up. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. And like, as I am Puerto Rican, so I'm very white passing Puerto Rican and uh -huh. tragic, but um, <laughs> I've had my own experiences with that word there. I'll be, I used to be embarrassed of having two last names where I'm like, oh my gosh, why am I the, the one Hispanic kid that yes. has two last names? <laughs> now I'm like, oh no, I have two. Put two. Yes. That's on my license. Put two. Exactly. Like you're proud of that shit because like, you know, we had so many people that came up out of that and was like, listen, no, like you're allowed to be a black Hispanic person. You're allowed to be a Hispanic person with two last names. Like you're allowed to exactly. be, you know, you're about, you're allowed to be all those things. You know, we're starting to see so much more representation, like in media and organizing. And yeah, it's like, it's so, so powerful. And I, and I really, that's what I really love about like what's happening now. You know, I, I wish it happened when I was younger, but you know, I'm very yeah. thankful, you know, even to, you know, find a partner who also is like Lexican as well. Like they really have healed so much, you know, and like we bond so much and so deeply on that. And just like the things that we went through, like as kids and, you know, even now, you know, navigating like what it means to be black and Mexican and sitting in this diaspora, you know, it's been very beautiful. Yes, of course. And I, I love seeing that representation growing within more and more of our culture. Like mm -hmm. just recently, because I'm a very avid reader. I love reading. And for the first time I read where the main character was both Hispanic and trans. And I was like, ah, I love they're, that. they're hitting the categories. I was like, oh my gosh. Sorry, my dog. She want to come up here. This is no palace. <laughs> oh my gosh. The beautiful pupper. We made it into the interview. She was like, what is happening up here? Who are you talking to, dad? <laughs> They're just like, I'm here too. I want to be here, be part of the interview. <laughs> we love it. We love our little pupper friends, of course. Yes, we do. You even stated a comment though, like when you mentioned like your hair, 
Um, mm-hmm. with, and I know this is a very common thing, especially with people in the black community and the Latinx community where people are like, oh my gosh, your hair, can I touch it? Can I play with it? It's just so curly, this and that. My hair's straight right now, but I've had a similar thing yeah. where my own mother couldn't figure out like, where did your hair come from? Uh, like it's so yeah. curly and she's just like, it's a mess, it's a mess, fix it. I didn't realize my hair was curly until college. Right. Like, oh, my hair's not frizzy. Mm-hmm. It's naturally curly. So, yeah. but now it's a trend, like it's a yeah. trend now. So mm-hmm. like with minor appropriations like that, what do you think can be considered like an appreciation or an appropriation, especially mm-hmm. with like the cosmetic feels of being someone in Hispanic and or in the la- uh, black community? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think that's something that's like really hard to kind of like um, understand and something that like even my partner like really um, pushes me on a lot because like I said like even in like Mexico and even shoot even in Puerto Rico you know what I mean you have a deep history of like black people living in those communities you know what I mean Almost definitely. and like having a culture of like Afro like Latinidad people you know my dad is black and you know my mother is Mexican but even still like people who have two Hispanic two Hispanic um, parents can still be Afro-Latina, you know what I mean? And I think that is uh, um, something that a lot of like black people are doing to police that. And, you know, I, I might get canceled for saying that shit, but it's for me and where I sit and like what I see, it's just like, we can't police for me anyways, I feel like we can't police like what blackness is and what blackness ain't, you know? And mm-hmm. two two people don't have to be um, to like parents and things like that. It's just like the Atlantic slave trade affected us all and it shows up in so many different ways, you know? Um, and if we're gonna be real about it, all of us was colonized, you know? And so, so I think there's just, again, there's a lot to unlearn and there's a lot of things that we need to like talk about when it comes around um, what it means to have like um, certain hairstyles and things like that, you know? And so I think it's, a, um, I don't have the answer yeah, just to be mm-hmm. point blank, you know? Um, but for me anyways, I know that I had to do a lot of unlearning for myself, you know? Um, even I just got box braids like two years ago because I was just like, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm black, but I'm not black, but it's like, bitch, look at your hair, bitch, you're black. You can have box braids. (laughs) And same for like, and so on from the Dominican Republic, like, come on now, like Haiti and Dominican Republic, they right next to each other. Sorry, Dominicans, y'all black point blank period you know (laughs) so exactly the reason why your hair works with box braids as well is because you're black and so (laughs) and so I think like I said there is a lot to um unlearn and oh look at her she's playing with her stuff now um (laughs) around because I think a lot of it just internally leads to a lot of anti-blackness and a lot of it internally um, has a lot to do with like white supremacy, you know? The thoughts that like some people can be black and some people can't be black is like not okay. And that's still using that same rhetoric, you know? Um, but again, I'm still learning a lot. I'm still processing a lot around, you know, what blackness looks like in like in the Hispanic community and how it looks different um, for every country. Um, and it's again it's geographical you know and and i keep circling back to that because it's true you know um it looks different for different countries um so yeah i think you said it real like wonderfully eloquent like there's not an exact answer i I did just want your perspective of this you also used a term such as anti-blackness where i noticed to the younger generation there they don't fully have a good concept of what that means So can you care to elaborate of what your definition is of anti-Blackness? Yeah, I think it just means, for me anyways, in the way that I understand it, is meaning that you are someone who really disassociates with, like, Blackness and Black culture. And Mm -hmm. anti, if we're looking at that word, meaning, like, not of or, like, meaning... um, well, that's not what anti means. Anti is like, you're not with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or you 
don't accept it. You know, that's how I view it anyways. Um, and not with blackness and black culture, what comes with like blackness. And a lot of what comes from blackness is um, very situational, you know, black people in the South are completely different from black people out, out West and completely different from black people up North, you know? Um, and I think, you know, black culture in itself is a whole, it's a whole encompassing thing. Um, but I think when you see it, you know it, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And when you see it and you know it and you kind of, uh, you know, or you're like, oh, that's not, you know, holding up to whatever standard or that is um, anything that's like associated with like wrong, then that's anti-Blackness. Um, making fun of someone because their hair is too kinky or making fun of someone's skin, you know, calling people like slurs or names because that's associated with their Blackness, that's anti-Black. Mm -hmm. And, you know, holding someone up to a standard because of their Blackness, that's anti-Black. And so I think it's like, again, I think it's a lot of things that like, are even embedded in a lot of cultures that like you don't even know that's anti-black you know mm -hmm. um something that really um touched me i i sat on this um this board um at the university of north florida here in jacksonville um and we read this poem um that was talking about um this cuban yeah she was cuban and even in cuba you know they call people morena and um, that's what inspired this tattoo on my neck. Um, that says, soy negra toda anar. Um, and basically she was saying that like, you know, no, I'm not morena, like I'm black, like don't get it twisted, you know? And that's what the whole poem is like talking about. Because again, a lot of cultures like try to move away from being black and they try to hide the fact that their countries um, are with, um, or like, they try to hide the fact, sorry, my brain is starting to die out. <laughs> they try to hide the fact that a lot of their countries, um, you know, slavery happened there. Like I said, like Haiti and Dominican Republic right next to each other. You got Dominicans, I swear they're not black. And it's like, girl, you know, same with Puerto Rico, same with Mexico. And oh, it's like, yep. girl, I'm sorry, but you black. <laughs> but again, yep. Because like when we think about blackness and like how it's situated, it's situated as nasty or not okay or like ugly or you know all those things. And so um, that's what that's for me, anyways. That's what I feel like anti-blackness is. Okay, so yes, it's good to know. I learned some of those things too, and I'm very glad. I like learning it because everything is a learning process, and you have to make sure you check and you learn every day for yeah. any process for it to pass and make sure it stays. Yeah, and that's and that's a lot of like why I even got this too because that poem just like really healed a lot of me because it's like, yes, like I am Hispanic, but also like I hold being black to the highest honor, period. And it is, it is an honor, that's who you are. It's your identity and it's something that should be celebrated. Exactly, and that's why I got it and I put that on my throat chakra so that I could always speak truth to that and not be ashamed of that, you know? Of course. And I did also have some questions for more of the LGBT side of things. Yeah, since sure. it is, <laughs> so it is a little bit more open now within the Hispanic community, though I do see that sometimes there's some like eternal conflicts, whether it be yeah. like traditional, cultural, or even like religious concepts, especially with certain Hispanic countries that are mm. heavily within the like Catholic or Christianism and all that stuff. So yeah. I know for people in the United States, it's a little bit not, I wouldn't say easier, but it's a little bit more open and that they have people that they can go to for support. Yeah. It's not the same for everybody, but it's a little bit more open and we can see it on everyday things now, such as television and media. But within Hispanic cultures, it seems like there is still a small issue with that. And yeah. uh, what do you think is the real issue? Is it more like a traditional? or like more of like an embedded thing of culture? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest. I think it is a lot of the embeddedness of like the church, if I'm to be honest, you know? Um, like you said, I mean, for my family anyways, I grew up Catholic, you know? Um, my mom always kept telling me what the Pope doing, what's going on with him. I'm like, okay, girl. And <laughs> And I think it does have a lot to do with that in the same regard with, um, with um, how you say, 
with um, the United States, you know, we have been colonized so much and have been brainwashed so much to believe that, you know, there's only two genders. But if we start going back into a lot of like indigenous culture, you know, we see that trans people, that two-spirited people like existed, you know, um, and they were our healers. They were our medicine people. They were um, our, the folks that like, you know, did like medium work and things like that. But like I said, because a huge part of colonization is like moving you so far away from your culture that you don't even know that those things even exist anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. For me, I feel that transness um, is ancestral. I feel like transness is indigenous um, and it's always been there. It didn't just show up like out of the middle of nowhere, you know? Um, and I think, again, it just has a lot to do with how we were raised and how far away we've been pushed from a lot of our cultures. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, you know, slowly but surely things are starting to change. But I feel like as they do at the same rate, you still are still seeing a lot of violence against, you know, um, a lot of trans people. I think not too long ago, like Puerto Rico had a huge march for, you know, trans um, women who were being murdered. Um, same with like in Colombia, um, same in like Africa, you know, we're, we are like, we are seeing a lot of visibility with transness, but at the same time, it still adds a layer of, you know, femicide that is happening within a lot of trans, like, and Hispanic cultures, you know, and we need to have more, you know, like, like, female, like, led organizations, like, female or femme, you know, whatever, um, Chicana or, you know, Latinx organizations that are centering the lives of, like, trans women, you know, because they do exist, they are out here, and they deserve um, to be at the table and deserve to be respected, you know, if not more than um, women in general. Of course, and I remember, like, a story, maybe, like, less than a year ago, where, like, a trans woman in Puerto Rico was murdered. And I remember thinking it, that was so heartbreaking because they were so young too. Yeah, I know. And you're seeing people like, you know, my queen, Bad Bunny, you know, bringing a lot of that to the front, you know, with him doing a lot of like gender fluid things and just like being him and also bringing to light, you know, some things that are happening in Puerto Rico around that. And so, yeah, it's really sad. And it's, it's great, like I said, that that visibility is happening. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we're protecting like trans um, Latinx folks, you know? Of course. And I'm glad you did bring up Bad Bunny. Lord and Savior right there. Grand man. <laughs> <laughs> but he did do a music video like Yo Perreo Sola where he was yes. highlighting that. And <gasps> gave me a lot of feels. <laughs> That was one of my favorite music videos. I was like, uh, okay, was, you were doing hot. it. It was hot. <laughs> of course. But I did want to ask him, like, how, since that was a subtle, not so subtle way of pointing out of the general politics of that happening and that being within the music industry, have you been noticing that happening more in the, in the media? And if you haven't, how do you inflict it within your own personal music? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think we're starting to see a lot of, like, not not traditional people like doing, um, you know, uh, gender fluid stuff. You know, we even saw like Little Nas X like on SNL, like doing his his bad bitch stuff. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and even with that new music video, um, I love it. And, you know, I think we're starting to see a lot more people, mainstream people push against, you know, that binary and like what it means to be like queer and like what it means to be like fluid or um, what it means to step out of like what, you know, a binary is, you know, um, and I think it's like super powerful. And I think we did see it for me anyways, I saw it a lot more because I did do a lot more in like queer, like underground scenes. So, you know, I've been seeing like drag queens, like rapping on stage and, you know, seeing drag queens, like being pop stars, you know, um, and trans women, you know, killing it. Um, and so I think it's really dope and it's very inspiring because now even more, we're starting to see it, I think in mainstream, you know, starting to see it on Saturday Night Live and starting to 
see yes. it on like, you know, music awards and stuff like that. And so it's really, really inspiring to see. And I'm really happy that like young people of this generation get this. Um, because it just means that we're going to normalize it more and more as like young people get, grow up, you know, um, and I think it's super powerful. That's beautiful. I love that. And you mentioned that you were like in charge or have a couple of organizations of your own that are mm -hmm. spread throughout like Jacksonville. Can you tell us like how you got started it, like creating these organizations or yeah. what inspired you to do so? Yeah, so I didn't create um, really any of them. I just like kind of got on board. So I really started getting a lot more politic when I got involved with Girls Rock Jacksonville. And mm -hmm. so Girls Rock is an international organization. Like I said, it's for girls, gender nonconforming and trans youth. Basically the skeleton of it is the youth get assigned an instrument. They have a week to write a song, but then we use music as a vehicle to teach social justice. So we have conversations around like, um, black queer women actually created rock and roll like here are actually like femmes and trans and non-binary people who are killing it um, talking about like what intersectionality is talking about racism talking about um, feminism and like I said it's an international organization so there are girls rock camps in Puerto Rico and Mexico and well I don't know about Puerto Rico but I'll say Mexico there's definitely one there <laughs> Brazil, Tokyo, Europe, you know, all over the United States. Um, and yeah, they really, that organization is what really gave me a lot of language around like what it means to be Afro-Latina that like gave me the language to say like, oh yeah, like I was oppressed because I had all of these identities, being black, being Mexican, living in the South. Like, you know, I experienced a lot of trauma um, and I didn't have that language, you know? Mm -hmm. And being a part of that organization really led me to start doing a lot more movement work. Um, and so once I started getting like deeper in my music, I was like, oh, like, I really want to like continue like what I learned at Girls Rock, which is like using my music as a vehicle to like highlight um, things that I go through and what my community goes through, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so then I started, um, you know, supporting uh, the Jacksonville Community Action Committee, which they do a lot of um, movement work around helping um, families who have been victims of police sanctioned violence. And so we support like, helping the families get justice. We do rallies around like their, um, their children's names and like kind of giving that, um, giving those narratives to the community and also talking about like what community control of the police looks like. Um, and another organization, like I said, I help with is um, Southerners on New Ground, which that organization is also is a national org too. Um, and they're focused around like ending cash bail um, and talking about melting ice. So ice, you know, as an ice ice. And yeah. so, <laughs> um, <laughs> which we know what ice is. And so, um, so yeah, I think it just, like I said, all started with Girls Rock. Um, and I really just love using my music, um, my dance parties to center um, organizers and like black and brown and like trans people and like using the dance floor as a space to think about like what liberation looks like, what liberation feels like and just having a safe space for like all those organizers who do hard, hard work to be in a space where they'll be respected, where they'll feel safe, you know, where they'll feel seen. Um, and also just have community, you know, and have a fun place to hang out and be. I love that. And can you tell our audience where they can find like, I, um, la, 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 I can speak English, but if you can tell our audience um, where they can find links to get access to these types of organizations. So they, if they want to be part of them, they can most definitely do so or find their own research about it. Yeah, definitely. So um, people can come to um, my website, G-E-E-X-E-L-L-A -E -E music um, at gmail.com. If you follow me on Instagram, um, at Giella, um, it's uh, all the links are in my bios. There's always a campaign going on or a rally that's happening that I'm always talking about. So you can see it in my, um, <laughs> in my um, link. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of amazing organizations like Jacksonville and internationally um, that are doing some really amazing work too. Um, 
um, like, uh, what is the organization? Mi Gente, they're a really dope, like Latinx led organization that centers like GNC and trans folks. Um, you've got, um, not only do you have song, but you also have like Bean that's out in LA that's doing a lot of amazing work around blackness and um, queerness. Um, and yeah, I think it's just like doing that research, figuring out like, there's probably something happening in your city, but the thing is you got to get lower to the ground to figure out like what those organizers are doing, because a lot of the time they need a lot of work. Um, they need a lot of help, you know, to do the work. Um, and there's just so much work to be done, you know? So, yeah. Yes, of course. And also please tell our audience where they can see like your music or any potential projects that you're coming up in the same link tree that yeah, you have yeah. on your just head over to my Instagram if you have Instagram if you don't um giellamusic.com that's where I'm usually updating all the things or posting all my stuff sorry my dog is going ham <laughs> on whatever toy she got um but yeah you can find all the things there and I'm always doing something child <laughs> <laughs> of course got with that long list I'm not surprised <laughs> so once again thank you so much with meeting us today I I've loved this conversation and I hope we get to hear more of this conversation soon with you again. Yes, definitely hit me up. I'm always doing something, like I said, and, you know, I'm so thankful to be here. Thank you so much for what y'all are doing and y'all are killing it. Thank you. So yes. bye friends. Bye friends. <laughs>